we have been discussing a lot of transformations and analysis for programs and one of the uh, kind of subtleties of all these uh, analyses is dealing with loops and so in data flow analysis because uh, because of the presence of loops we require multiple iterations of the data flow analysis iteration algorithm right the fixed point iteration algorithm for example if there were no loops in our programs then data flow analysis would have just finished the fixed point iteration algorithm would have just finished in one iteration and so that's good for handling some types of analysis that are required for loops but there are so many other types of interesting optimizations and transformations and analyses that can be performed on loops that are not really uh, fit that do not really fit in the uh, in this as data flow analysis all right so we're going to discuss some of them in the coming few modules now why are we looking at loops specifically because loops are firstly very commonly present in our programs i am not aware of any uh, you know practical useful program that does not have at least some loops and also most of the run time of a program is actually spent in loops so if you can optimize loops better you must try to do that and the question here is that okay what are the optimizations that are possible for loops and if once we discuss those optimizations how they fit with all the other optimizations that we have discussed uh, which were modeled as data flow analyses okay so let's look at an example of a loop transformation and i'm using this example on the slide uh, let's say there is a computation t equals m plus n and then there's a loop and the loop is really simple and c there's a for loop for i equals 0 to n i plus plus ai equals t now you can see that this program already uh, has loop invariant code motion implemented and this is something that we have already discussed so there is no redundancy uh, there's no partial redundancy in this particular program because loop ai is uh, different for every iteration t has already is just a variable because it has been already uh, moved out the computation for t has already been moved out but we can still make this loop better all right so how can we make this loop better well i claim that the uh, version on the right is a equivalent to the version on the left and b it is actually a better version in terms of run time than the left although it looks bigger so it looks like it's slightly bigger code size perhaps but from a run time perspective the right side program would typically be faster than the left side program so let's and first look at the right side program so the right side program says if n is greater than 0 i equal 0 do while so in in the original program i had for which is also similar to the while loop construct here i have a do while construct so in a, the difference between while do and do while is in do while the first iteration is always executed all right so so the first iteration is executed in this case it would be a0 equal 0 i plus plus and then we will check and if the check succeeds uh, we are going to go back to the start of the do while loop which means this statement and if it fails then we are going to come out of the do while loop now you can check for yourself that both the programs are ident are kind of functionally equivalent in the sense that they assign the same values to uh, the array a uh, from i to n they just assign both of, both of them both of these programs are assigning the same values to the elements of array a so these programs are equivalent but uh, you know what is the point why is this a good transformation why is this an optimization so to understand that let's look at the control flow graphs of the two programs in the first program this uh, the first block is maybe uh, doing t equals m plus n the second block is probably doing i it's also doing i equals 0 right because this is the initialization condition that gets in, uh, executed before the loop starts right at the first uh, before the first iteration of the loop and then it never executes right so that's what a for loop means so i equals 0 also gets executed in this basic block and then i check whether i is less than n if i is less than n uh, then if it is false then you exit if it is true then you execute the body of the loop and the body of the loop is probably ai equals t and then after you execute ai equals t there is an unconditional branch to the condition the, the header of the loop which is the condition of this particular for loop which is i is less than n so this is an unconditional branch and this is a conditional branch right because here there are two things that are going out 
Now here there is a single branch that's coming out. So it's a, this, because it's a single branch that's coming out, it's an unconditional branch. Because it's just two branches that are coming out, it's a conditional branch. Because depending on the condition, it's going to go one way or the other. Now, why is this a condition? Why is this a, an unconditional branch? Well, it's very clear that this is a branch because it's moving. It's it's kind of, it wants to jump to the top of the loop. So it can't. It's not like it's going to be a fall through region. I cannot place the condition after the body, right? So that won't make sense. Just make this clear. Maybe it's not. So uh, it, I can't place i is less than n after a i equals t, right? So I have to execute the branch. To get back to i is less than n, so I need an unconditional branch. Now let's look at the program on the right, and this is the control flow graph of the program on the right. I first do t equals m plus n, then I do uh, n, then I check whether n is greater than zero or not. If it is false, then I go to exit. If it's true, then I go to this particular basic block, which is the body, uh, which, you know, which is not still. Which is, uh, you know, so actually I should have added one more uh, basic block here, which I'm missing. So let me just add it. So on the two branch, there should have been one more basic block, which would say i equals zero. Okay. And then we basically uh, just fall through. So it's not a branch. I mean, it's just the next instruction to the, uh, to the body of the loop. So this is going to be the body of the loop. And this is basically... The first statement of the body of the loop is going to be ai equals i. All right, and then maybe I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to say i plus plus. Okay, and then I'm, I have a conditional branch. Now I'm going to check here uh, that whether i is less than n or not. So maybe I do i plus plus here rather than there. And in this particular basic block, let me just write this again. This let me check i is less than n. Now, if i is less than n, then if it's true, then you jump back. If it's false, then you jump to exit. So this is what the new program, transform program looks like. Now, why is this a better or faster program than the first program? And the answer is, you should know, you know what is the most important? It seems like that the program has become bigger, slightly bigger, because maybe I have two checks. I have if n is greater than zero, and then while i is greater than n, uh, i is less than n. So it seems like there are two checks in this program, whereas in the original program there was only one check, which was i less than n. So why is this program better? Well, the, to answer this question, you have to first ask where is this program spending most of its time in. And so we're going to make the assumption that most of the time the program is spending in the loop because the initialization is going to only happen once, but maybe the loop is going to get executed a million times. And so if the loop is getting in, in, uh, uh, executed a million times, all the instructions that are a part of the loop are going to be executed a million times. And so if we can reduce one instruction in the loop, uh, that's a reduction of million instructions overall. So I'm going to claim that the second program, the program on the right, has fewer instructions in the loop than the program on the left. And so that can be seen because in the program on the right, the uh, there is a i equals i, i plus plus, and then there is a conditional branch. So there's only one conditional branch, or only one branch, you know, conditional or unconditional, in the body of the loop. That conditional branch either jumps to the beginning of the loop, the head of the loop, or it just exits. All right. Where on the program on the left actually has two branches. One of them is the conditional branch, which is coming just from the beginning of the, the header of the loop. And the other is the unconditional branch that's jumping back to the header of the loop. So if you look at that, then um, also, I, I mean, you know, of course, this is not complete. This should have been I++ as well. All right. So, if it, so when you look at this, you can see that there is there are two branches. Everything else is the same. But the program on the left has two branches, one unconditional branch and one conditional branch. Whereas the program on the right has only one branch, just the conditional branch inside the loop body. And so we are saving one branch in the transform program in the loop body. Although the, there may be more branches in the rest of the program, in the, which is going to be executed less often, but inside the loop body, we have been able to save an instruction. More importantly, a branch. And in fact, you know, a branch is one of the more expensive instructions. If you, uh, if you uh, consider the computer architecture, underlying, underlying computer architecture, uh, you know, if you take, for example, a five-step pipeline, or even if you take a more complex, modern superscalar machine, 
a branch can uh, makes problems difficult uh, for the hardware because either it has to correctly predict what is the target of the branch or it has to flush the pipeline. So branches are actually expensive propositions compared to other uh, instructions like um, arithmetic. And so saving a branch is a big deal. You know, it's, it's a bigger deal than saving an instruction. In both cases, uh, you know, because it's a part of the loop, if you save even uh, some part of it, then you know, you just multiply it by a factor of uh, the number of times the loop is going to execute. And so this is a very worthy optimization. And so here is, I mean, basically here is the summary of uh, why this is a transformation. In this particular program, there are two branches per iteration. And in this particular program, there's only one branch per iteration. Okay, great. And, and we already discussed that uh, branches become difficult to predict in hardware. And so you, if reducing a branch is actually a significant optimization. All right, so, so this kind of transformation uh, is actually called loop inversion because in a way we have inverted the loop from for a loop we have made it a do while loop right so where the first iteration is definitely going to execute and then we are going to check after that so in the original loop the check was at present at the beginning of the loop in the new loop the check is present at the end of the loop and we have one extra check outside the loop right and so this kind of uh, transformation is also called loop inversion right so we also call this loop inversion all right, so, all right. Now, this is just one example of a loop transformation and why it is an effective transformation. Also notice that this transformation has very little to do with kind of transformations that we have discussed earlier, which were based on data flow analysis. This kind of transformation requires us to understand the loop structure and then uh, transform it based on our understanding of what it is. And so what is a loop structure anyway? And I, you know, typically most loops are going to have this structure, which is there is some initialization, uh, there is some condition to, to check on every iteration of the loop, including the first iteration, before the first iteration, and then there is some step which is executed at the end of the loop. And because this is a common pattern, the for uh, construct was introduced in high level languages like C uh, and everything above it. And so, so, I mean, one way to easily see this loop structure is to just use the for construct. And so there's an initialization condition, uh, a, a cond, there's an initialization statement, a condition, and a step. And if I look at it from a control flow graph perspective, I first execute init, right? For example, i equals zero. Then I execute cond, for example, check whether i is less than n or not. If it is false, then just exit the loop. If it's true, then execute the body of the loop. All right, notice that I haven't executed the step yet. After we have executed the body, then execute the step, for example, I++. And then you jump back to the condition. And so this is a very common structure of a loop, uh, especially a for loop is exactly this kind of structure. So with this structure, uh, you know, we can basically, once we understand and we are able to identify the structure of the loop, we can do many things with it. And loop inversion was something that we have seen. And so let's try to see this in this abstract world, right? So we saw loop inversion using a concrete example. Now I'm going to try to show how loop inversion would should be modeled in the abstract world where we just considering these statements as arbitrary statements in it, con, body, and step. So, before I do that, let me uh, say that it is very easy to basically see that once you are able to identify the structure, then you can easily say, okay, let me unroll the loop a little bit and put the first few iterations in the, with the initialization. And so I can kind of remove some iterations of the loop and put, and kind of put them just after in it outside the loop. And this kind of transformation is called loop peeling. All right, so what is loop peeling? Well, here's an example of loop peeling. I kind of took these three statements, con, body, and step, and just made, created a copy of them here, all right? Now created a copy of them, and then I kind of pasted the loop again. And so I claim that the program on the right is equivalent to the program on the right, left, because I, in both cases, I do in it, then I check con, then if it's false, then I exit the loop, all right. If it's true, then I execute the body, then I execute the step, and then I check cond again. But in this case, I check, I, know I just go back to check the cond again. So I have kind of peeled, peeled, so the, the word is peeled, 
the first iteration of the loop right so it's like it's a loop i just peeled the first iteration and put it at the head before the header of the loop in the pre header of the loop all right so this is you know i just put it after the init and now this part is not a part of the loop now this is called the loop peeling you know once again to implement loop peeling we need to understand the structure of the loop just like we had to understand the structure of the loop to uh, implement loop inversion and we're going to uh you know there are many situations where loop peeling is going to actually result in a speed up and we're going to see uh, examples of that later but first thing i want to point out that even loop inversion is just a special form of loop peeling because in loop inversion we are just peeling out some parts of the first iteration not the entire so in this example i have peeled out the entire first iteration which includes cond body and step what if i just peeled out the con and not body and step Uh, then i would have got loop inversion so how does that work loop inversion is a special case of loop peeling i just peeled out con and that's all right so i just kind of created two copies of con first is outside the loop and the other is inside the loop just like before and also because of that the con is now moved you know so con is kind now now moved at the end of the loop because it's like it's a circular thing if i pick one out then the other you know the 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 one from the next iteration just moves to the bottom of the loop in the previous slide i had put all the entire iteration out so the loop looked identical in this inversion case i just pulled one component of the first iteration out and so uh, that component's copy inside the loop now moves to the end of the loop and so this is what the new loop looks like say in it then you do the condition just like you would have done in the original program if it's false you exit if it's true then you execute the body in both the cases then you execute the step in both the cases and in this case you would have done an extra branch to get back to the con here you don't need the extra branch you just do the con because of the fall through of the program and then if the con is true then you jump back to the body otherwise you uh, uh, you jump uh, jump to the exit so functionally these two programs are equivalent structurally they are slightly different in one case i have basically peeled out one iteration uh, one one condition check of the first iteration of the loop outside and i'm claiming that this is exactly i mean this kind of transformation this kind of transformation is nothing but loop inversion okay so let's go back to our original example in our original example this was the original code uh, uh, control flow graph t equals m plus n No, so this was the original uh, code uh, program. I equals zero, I is less than n, I equals t, and this is basically the um, inverted version. And in the inverted version, what I have done is, if this is, uh, you know, in, in in this code, this is the initialization, this is the condition, and this is the step. And now in the transform program, I again do initialization first, then I do condition. but i have just put the condition outside the loop then i execute the body then i do the condition again so i have created two copies of the condition that's what i have done and then if the condition is true i go back to the loop and if i the condition is false i jump out of the loop i go to exit of the loop also i think i forgot to also draw a an exit from the first condition now you may say oh the condition was i is less than n how did you get zero is less than n well that you know i you could have just i i just kind of omitted a step you could have said i is less than n here too just that i you know now that i have peeled out this it's very easy to see that i can constant propagate i because at this particular location in the transformed code i is definitely a constant and so i can just replace i with zero and so that i uh, and so that becomes zero is less than n and and that's exactly the code that we have on the right so zero is less than n just translates to n is greater than 0 i should point out that loop inversion is a very very common uh, transformation because a it saves a branch in the loop body and we have already discussed that saving even a single instruction in the loop body may mean saving millions of instructions overall and second it is actually applicable to all loops right because firstly most of us write loops in this way humans write loops in this way whereas this is the more optimized implementation of the same loop 
and notice that this transformation is not making any assumptions about what the loop is. For example, it doesn't need any kind of uh, properties that n should be a constant or i, you know, it, uh, there should be this structure to the loop or this is how the value should be used. Almost every loop that has this structure can be transformed to this structure and that is what typically modern compilers also do and so loop inversion is a very very common transformation. To summarize, optimizations that make a loop faster are usually very consequential and so much effort has gone into this and we are going to study some of these efforts to understand what is the state of the art in trying to optimize loops. <laughs>